Um, yeah, it's, 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 it's really, really long. <laughs> I mean, it's a long thing. Uh, I started really thinking about it in June. Mm -hmm. um, at the time, I was, I was working in Switzerland um, at ETH, Zurich, mm -hmm. which is a large technical university there, on some of the stuff related to my senior research here, some of the things I wanted to do. And, um, and I did some research about where I was thinking of going, and I realized that there are some particular things at Oxford that are happening. And obviously, this scholarship is like something mm -hmm. that's pretty well advertised. Right. Um, and, and I do a lot of different things, and the scholarship is interested in people who do a lot of different things, and this is convenient. Uh, and also it has a good role in team, too. And yeah, you know, exactly. And, and so things sort of like panned out nicely. I mean, so I, you know, so the normal path for people doing physics, um, which is what I work in, is you, you, you graduate and then you basically start right into your PhD, mm -hmm. um, take some classes for a few years, and then, and then you just do research. And, and I knew that I wanted to spend a little bit of time working on mathematics um, and some background, which I can talk about more. And so I was looking at sort of like something to do in between both PhD and there were some particular concepts that I wanted to work on. And, and so that matched nicely. And then the fact that it also happens to be the best place to grow as a postgraduate student is, is excellent. Um, so yeah, I started, writing, I started writing the essays um, while I was in Zurich, showing the people there. And talk to my advisors here um, and the faculty here, mm -hmm. Rob Schulkoff and Michelle Deveray especially, um, just who I've been working with here mostly, and uh, and then other professors. And every everyone was just extremely helpful. And it took it took a long time. And I obviously the uh, like Yale Fellowship Office was really helpful to keep things organized. And uh, Kate Dow really knows her stuff. Uh, and she she coordinates the UK the UK office. Um, so you do that, and then. Spend a lot of time putting all this together. It takes forever, and then you submit it, and then you just sort of wait. Okay. Uh, you know, until all this stuff, and you wait, and then all of a sudden, you just get this little email that's like, "By the way, you're like coming to the finals interviews oh. this weekend." So then it's just like big gap. Um, and then, and then we show up in ISO. It's the things we go through the details. Organize the So there's like this 32 students taking from the U.S. to each of 16 regions, and so mine was Virginia and Georgia. Yeah, so you want to, um, so you specify what courses, what course you want to take, um, though when you get in, um, you can apply for a different one and you can look at different things. Um, but I, so I was looking at this particular program in, it's, it's a Master's of Science in Mathematics, and Mathematics and the Foundations of Computer Science. Okay. Um, because what I work in here, the field I work in is quantum information, mm -hmm. and so what we're trying to do is merge physical theory with like sort of other theories from mathematics, information theory, and computer science, um, to try and like to try and describe things in physics in ways that are more applicable applications that we might have. So, how can we want to design a computer? We should probably maybe use the language of computer science to natively describe what's happening in physical systems. This makes things a lot more clear. So here I've been working with, uh, in Michelle DeVray's Quantronics lab. And so Quantronics is a portmanteau of quantum and electronics. Um, and so it's, we're, what we're trying to do is say that everything people have developed in both theoretical and applied computation, and so by that I mean like design of programming languages and Turing machines for theoretical computer science, or in application how you build computers, which is nowadays based on 
classical electrodynamics. There's sort of like a new generation of theories that can be used to reinvent computer or computation uh, based on the advances in physics that have happened in the last hundred years. So normal computers are based on classical electrodynamics, and, but we know that the world isn't classically like Maxwell's electrodynamic equations. It's actually quantum mechanical. And so what can we do if we actually are approaching the world from a fundamentally quantum mechanical standpoint? How can, what kind of systems can we build? What new things can they compute? And this is totally, you know, it's very, it's very sort of not pinned down yet. Uh, a lot of the theory has to figure out just how much better we can do. But because of a lot of the weird things in quantum mechanics, it seems like we should be able to compute some very fundamental things a lot faster. And for, so, for example, one of the main things uh, that's been shown um, we could do better if we had a computer that was fundamentally quantum mechanical uh, is, is factor large prime numbers. And this is really important because the fact that it, every classical algorithm that we know of takes a really, really long time to factor a very, very large prime number, something on the order of you know, the age of the universe or something, and a quantum computer of some reasonable size could do it in a day, uh, this sort of fundamentally changes uh, how any encryption works. And there's a lot of other classes of algorithms, and there's a lot of research going into how, on the theory side, can we use these, the, the new behaviors that we're able to access because we can look at very, very small quantum systems that act very strangely. And then on the flip side of this, and the other reason I'm interested in it, is not just because of the things you can build with it, but also how you can do fundamental physics research. really precisely control quantum mechanical systems, you can test whether or not quantum mechanics is right a lot better. And you can find out what you know what is actually going on here. And you can, so both by advancing technology, by advancing technology, you can you can both do sort of applied advances and also fundamental physics research at the same time. And they work in tandem. Uh, and a qubit is is a quantum system which can have two states. And in a quantum system, you're not always discretely zero or one. It can exist in these superpositions of more than one. And so the way they do it in here at Yale, and they've been they've been making remarkable remarkable advances over the last 15 years here. Um, is this sort of, well, one way to do it is you can take something that's already quantum mechanical, like the levels of an electron in an atom, um, and try and use those as your computational basis, like take those states from nature. And the other way to do it is to try and, so that's taking something that's already quantum mechanical and trying to like get at it with your technology that's, you know, big and large and used for uh, doing the computation sort of stuff, the manipulation. Or you can take something that's a bit larger, like a superconducting circuit, and try to make it act quantum mechanical, even though it's physically much, much larger. Um, and so that's what, the, that's what we do here, um, is you, you take it, and the reason that's useful is we, there's been a lot, like we're really, really good at building uh, like sort of the same kind of chips that are used in your computer. Like your, your Pentium is patterned, patterned down to like 20 nanometers now. And at that size, quantum mechanical effects are really important, and, and Intel and IBM are trying to avoid quantum mechanical effects because they're getting so small in there. So well, we can use the same, with these scales, we're good at working there because of market pressures. <laughs> um, so it means that we can, we can take this technology and apply it to doing fundamental physics research and then taking advantage of it instead of trying to mitigate quantum mechanical effects. And here they've been building all sorts of different types of electronic devices. It's not like you just set out and build a computer. You have to start with a couple of fundamental components. And one thing they built was it was a quantum bus, which is sort of like a large resonator. It, it allows separate quantum qubits to communicate with each other uh, in, a, in a, you know, it's a fundamental building block of a computer. Another thing that I specifically have been working on is, is this particular quantum amplifier that you can use to amplify quantum signals very, very finely with a very, very low amount of noise, which is really important for feedback correction. Um, and so the, there's, there's a lot that goes, in, goes into the different components. And so, and so at Oxford, actually, um, I'm going to be doing a little bit more theoretical research. Um, because it looks like while a lot of advances have been made in uh, the last 10 years, we're still at about of the order of, you know, uh, so it depends, it depends, it's a couple of different systems because quantum computation is, is a theoretical idea and then it gets instantiated in a bunch of physical systems. Like I was saying, in, in, you can do it in this, the levels of an electron in an atom or the oscillating, like an, an LC oscillator circuit. And so these are different physical manifestations of the same quantum computing idea. Um, but it, it, we're still, you know, stuck below basically 10 qubits right now. That, that could interact with each other in any uh, in any particular paradigm, 
And, and the, the lifetimes and the stability of these qubits has been increasing pretty steadily. Um, but what we need are sort of more applications for the smaller systems that we're probably going to have in the next 10 or 15 years. Because things like this RSA encryption, encryption breaking things that you, you may have heard about, or you know, perfect cryptography, um, they, or certain search algorithms. Like a lot of the algorithms we have now that we know would be better on a quantum computer require quantum computers that are going to take us a while to get. And so there's sort of like these intermediate sized quantum computers that should be very useful. We're just not sure exactly how to use them yet. Um, they could, you know, things like quantum like simulating quantum mechanics is really easy on a quantum computer because it's, the size of a quantum simulation grows uh, exponentially, classically. But with a quantum computer, you can do it grow. It grows linearly. Um, and so, so a lot of work needs to be done in figuring out what are the theoretical applications we can do, sort of like more medium-sized computers, and how can we improve the error correction so that when we have a bunch of imperfect parts. How can we make perfect systems? And so I'm going to be working in a particular kind of mathematics. Uh, it's called category theory. Um, and it's sort of the most general theory. It's the, sort of the theory of processes in general, including like proving things, including like every other mathematical structure, or including computational processes in this case, in, or, or physical processes. Uh, and so the, <laughs> there's like a lot of very large structural aspects to it. But the hope is that using uh, a lot of the sort of mathematical encoding of category theory will make things about quantum mechanics that we find useful more apparent. A, a lot of what's changed to make these advantages, adva uh, advances happen is that people have looked at quantum mechanics in a new way. It was originally formulated in you know, with vector mechanics, and linear algebra, and partial differential equations, and Hilbert spaces. And so it turns out that that original formalism made a couple basically kind of simple things hard to see. Like the fact that you can't exactly clone a quantum state or you can't exactly, you can't delete a quantum state. These are like fairly simple proofs. Basically the no cloning one, like, you know, it's like a couple lines. I mean. uh, but it was just hard to see because of the formalism. And so it took a while for people to realize how they could apply it in a computational context to rewrite the formalism. And so what I'm going to be looking at is sort of like the best we've been able to figure out so far is to like intuitively rewrite quantum mechanics in a way that makes the things we care about more obvious.